take off my I'm gonna take off my glasses so I can see the script. So if I seem a little owly, I apologize. So anyway, uh good evening everybody and welcome. Thank you for coming. Um hope you're all doing very well. My name is Stephen Salmoni and I'm a member of the board of directors for POG and I'll be the MC for this evening. Uh, it's very good to see you and thank you for joining us on this spring evening to hear some poetry. Tonight, I'm very happy to welcome two very wonderful readers, and I'm learning more about each of you. I'm very happy you're here. Uh, Brooke Sani and David Wilk. David, I met a while ago. Brooke, I've just met today, so thank you. Um, before I turn the, the square, the rectangle, the podium over to Charles Alexander, who'll be introducing Brooke and saying a couple of words uh, that's some other things too. Uh, just a couple of items of business that we typically take care of before we start. So first, POG would like to thank the following organizations and groups for their support. The Arizona Commission on the Arts, the Arts Foundation for Tucson and Southern Arizona, Poets and Writers, Barbara Grigudis and Sculpture Tucson, Shaq's Press, and the U of A Poetry Center, and anybody that I may have missed. And also we'd like to thank individuals, our, our individual patrons and sponsors for their very generous contributions. We would not be able to do any of this programming without you. Uh, our patrons are Charles Alexander, Gloria Giffords, Lisa Martin, John Melillo, Cynthia Miller, Tendi Nathanson, Stephen Salmoni, Marcia Sherry, Joanna Skibsbird, Richard Taverner, and our sponsors, Susan Anderson Smith, uh, Raquel Gutierrez, Nancy Jacques, Joan Larkin, Hank Laser, David Navarro, and David Weiss. If anybody would be interested in helping us with donations, please visit our website. Maybe Charles could put the link in the chat at some point. It's www.pogartstucson.org, and there's a little link for membership. You can become a patron for $100, a sponsor for $50, or anything that you might feel like contributing, and we really appreciate it. Um, one other uh, in-person reading that we have scheduled for the year, an evening of poetry and music with Andrew Levy and Janice Lowe, April 27th at 7 p.m. We're still working on the location because we have to get a piano in someplace. We, we bring ourselves to a piano. And so please check the website. I don't know if you have any update on that, Charles, but you could tell us about that. Um, but please check our website for more information. And if you're on our mailing list, we'll send you a notification as well. Um, at the conclusion of the reading, we typically spend some time just talking with the poets. So Brooke and David, if you'd like to do that, that'd be great. There's, I think, you know, a small group here, we could just have a good time talking. And finally, just a couple of statements of the heart, maybe. Um, one, POG intends to be an inclusive, supportive, and most importantly, a safe space for everyone. If anyone should feel otherwise, please do reach out to one of our directors. And you can please raise your hand and maybe Charles, if you want to put my email or your email in the chat to you know, just to have that, because we can't really do that in person as well, right? And secondly, Pog would also like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we call home. Tucson, where Pog is based, is the ancestral home of the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki nations. We'd ask that we please take this moment to reflect on how, in the wake of a history of violence and dispossession, we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And thank you to John Melillo for drafting that beautiful statement. Is it my turn now? I think so. I will, I will yield my square to Charles. Okay. And I did want to say, um, Yes, we have the Steinfeld Warehouse for the music oh, okay. event on April 27th. And I think I just closed something that I was going to read or got it behind everything. Hang on. Okay. Uh, before the introductions, I wanted to say something. And that is, in the last few weeks, poetry has lost two individuals who have moved our imaginations, our poetics, our poems, our lives in ways we never would have anticipated, both of them breaking ground in this work we share, Lynn Higinian and Tyrone. Oh, no. 
Both were particularly important members of the poetry communities Pog and Chax Press have put forward over the years of our existence. I want to offer simply just a few of their words, then ask for a moment of silence. So Lynn, from my life, the world in its habits, word in the world it inhabits. That's woods, that reminds me, a time slowed down and a distance brought forward, the wave given pause, a rose, something on paper, time's up. And also from Lynn from Sunflower, a collaboration with Jack Collum. And I picked a collaboration because I think she was always collaborating with all of us. But what colors are? Dots syntax into a cherry bow, cherry wood bow, attached to melodramas acted out by clocks. Do I mean clouds? Clattering, light green. The horn's whistle's white streak is grammar's worm, morning's light, winter's slippage, down through amusing scallops, barely averts denudation and its consequences, nudity and unity. Whose shadow is that across the counter, moving against mine? And Tyrone Williams, or as many friends I noticed have called him in the last several days, beautiful Tyrone, from his first book, CC, hope ends and thinking breaks out. Uncertain violence, which is not despair, or if despair, sublime despair, disfigured hope. The table already broken gets cleared. Double consciousness gets swept aside by polyentendres, duck rabbits, wavicles. Neither waving nor drowning, we tread water like a page turning in a book. We trace the arc of Icarus. The sky only seems to fail, and then only sideways, like a page turning in a book. And in the larger arc of Daedalus, hope settles in another country, ending thought. We neither wave nor drown, we turn. And that book ends with a series of tags, the final one being, what was certain for the most part, hearts uncertain in the end, right? So please, uh, 30 seconds of silence for these two artists, Tyrone Williams and Lynn Hegenian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Brooke Sani lives in the high desert country of Arizona and teaches in Prescott, a place known for innovative and interdisciplinary approaches to education, knowledge, living. The word, the logos, may have begun in another high desert long ago and far away, and it certainly continues across these southwest desert lands and languages. About a year ago, I came across Sonny's work and I am so glad I did. Maggie Smith chose Sonny's before I had the word for the XJ Kennedy Prize for a reason. Her work imagines desire and jealousy at the beginning of the human experience in I Like to Imagine, where Adam and Eve are naked and Eve ravenous for physical love, even in response to its absence. In perigee, she extols absence as defining our sense of fullness. In her chapbook, Divining, she explores the liminal borders between human and divine, yet also says, what I mean is, I don't think about metaphor. Perhaps like William Carlos Williams's, no ideas but in things, 
Yet in Sani, things may be emotions, memories, ghosts of things. What Sani does is surprise our expectations. And isn't that precisely what we hope poetry can do? Please welcome Brooke Sani. Thank you. That was so beautiful. I thought you were going to read my bio. <laughs> so it's always really nice when somebody writes their own introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Charles. And thank you to those of you who are joining in. Um, what should I start with? I think I'm. I'm actually only going to read a few poems from before I had the word, here it is, um, just to put a visual. I have a new manuscript. So the the poems that um, Charles referenced are actually from a new, well, it's not new. I wrote it like three years ago, but it hasn't come out yet. So the Eve poems are from a new manuscript called In This Distance. And it should be coming out next year, but I haven't signed the kind the contract, so I'm not going to say anything more than that. So I'll read uh, some poems from before I had the word, and then I'm excited to actually read the majority of um, poems from this new-ish manuscript um, that should be coming out next year. I wanted to say a little something about process, which if someone had asked me four or five years ago about process, I don't know if I'd have much to say, but um, part of my process has, a really important part has been that I have started to think of my poetry as a uh, very connected and linked. So I wrote the poems in Before I Had the Word in order, which is something that I never would have thought I would <laughs> like would do when I was an undergraduate I thought of poetry very just like this this poem is separate and this poem is separate and now it's completely changed and I've found it very generative to think of poetry in projects where they all kind of build off one another so I wanted to say that and just a few things about before I had the word um so yeah I wrote these in graduate school and I wrote them I conceptualized it as an entire book which was uh yeah very it was it changed me in my process completely when I started thinking of it that way um some of I and again I'm not going to read too much from here but some of the things that I thought about with this book um were just different ways of knowing and meaning making. I used my two religious backgrounds, which is uh, Sikhism and Judaism, as what I call springboards to write these poems. Um, these poems, for me at least, are making an argument actually against religion, organized religion, and are making more of an argument of um, the spiritual and kind of the mundane and nature and sexuality. Um, so there's, I mean, there's a lot to say, but I'm just going to read, I think I'm going to read four from here, and then I'll move on to In This Distance, which is a different manuscript. I think Charles referenced this poem a little bit. So these are also written, not only did I write them in order, but I conceptualized them as a chronology where the speaker gets older as the book goes on. So this uh, poem is in the very beginning. Um, I went to Jewish day school when I was a kid, and they asked us to draw God in art class. And I remember just being like, what? Like, that's like, like knowing even as a child that that was impossible. Um, and I was really kind of frustrated with the exercise. Um, I'm saying a lot, I don't usually do this, but one more thing I'll say, uh, I was really interested in the missing O in the word God. A lot of Jewish people uh, will omit the, the, the letter O in the word God because they think if the whole word is written out, um, G-O-D, and that paper is discarded, that it's a sign of disrespect. Um, so that was a huge thing from a poetic standpoint that I was like super interested in is like, whoa, like here's this word God and it's such a huge word and there's this missing center in the middle. 
Um, so anyway, this poem is called God G-D, a portrait. First, we were taught how to spell his name. Then we were told to draw him. It was an exercise in metaphor. The balls of paper amassed before me while my classmates drew stars, maps of the Holy Land. I thought I should color everything I could think of knowing. Human hands, the yeah. golden breakfast yolk, thick skinned tree, knowing somewhere it was all correct. Writing G-O-D in the corner of the page, discarding it, and still everything remained the same. Then the desecrated flower drawn out in parts, stem, petal, stamen, pollen, even a bee to operate. Because yeah. between the third and the seventh day, it all happened so suddenly. Where God was impatient, I took my time. Outside, new plants went on growing as we sat in our huddles, trying to draw something. Um, so I'm just gonna read a few more. So as I said, as this book goes on, the speaker gets older and she comes into knowing, um, she starts considering different ways of knowing that are outside of religious scripture. Um, and there's a lot of father and mother poems. So the idea of what knowledge do we get from our parents? So this is a mother poem. What my mother knows, and the, I should say the speaker is still relatively young <laughs> in this poem. Um, minutes ago, I tell you, I want to eat a leaf for dinner. What unplanned response Buddhists might call mushin or no thought. It's summer and our small yard is swollen, giving. The low hanging elm leaves refract Edens of light. My new swing is a lifeline to the sky. Dipping my head back up and the returning blood spins everything godly. Thanks to you, before me, the large palmed leaf glistens on a white plate. My small bite is bitter, but there is joy. Where God says, forbidden, you say, eat. Um, okay, just a few more from this one. So now the speaker is older, sort of at a preteen age. And this poem is called Divining. And this is, um, there's also, with the religions that I explore in this book, there's like a deep exploration of books and texts in general. So there's there's an exploration of the Torah and the Sikh scripture. And as, um, yeah, this poem is, there's a different scripture, which is a cosmopolitan magazine <laughs> for a bunch of preteen uh, girls. Divining. The room is full, fire, air, water, and me, all earth. Years away from sex, we ache. Last week, our kind of friend, the prophetess, fire, told us if a girl doesn't shave her pussy, a boy will never touch her there. Between her legs, the glossed pages of the magazine, her voice cool as amethyst. Mute, so. Um, Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm going to mute everybody and then unmute you, Brooke. I mean, okay. Sounds good. If I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't. Oh, here we go. I don't actually see those settings. So, if 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 everyone can either mute themselves or just Stay quiet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think I'm, I'm muted. Mm. Says mute. What more can you do? Okay. Hang on. And, and I just asked Brooke to unmute. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, between her legs, the glossed pages of the magazine, her voice cool as amethyst. <laughs> How to give the perfect flavored blowjob, how to remove period stains, how to eat and not get full. Mm. How simple it is to forget the, the animal. Inside designer alligator boots, mink coat, black hide, silkworm spun to paisley. She finds the horoscope page. The inward waters and I have been waiting for this. So certain of my body, what forms I will take, what sulks beyond this. I, the only Virgo, make my way down to my back, wait to be divined. Outside, the sky is dark, too distant. There are no stars. Okay, I'm just going to read one more from before I had the word. Um... And this comes at the very end, it's the second to last poem. So the speaker is uh, older, um, this has a brief mention to Lake Erie, I'm from Ohio. Okay, so, and this is also calling back to um, the missing O in the word God, except it's now referring to a different, Sorry, <laughs> I think we're still getting some yeah. no, there's noise. It's black. I don't know who's speaking, but it's coming across despite everyone showing up as muted. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. Okay. Please try again, and I apologize, Brooke. It's okay. We, we're good? Yeah. Okay. So this poem comes towards the end of before I had the word and um, there's a different missing letter in a word in my name, the speaker's name. <laughs> um, okay. If you took out the E, it could be like the stream, the woman behind the counter says. And for a moment, a new way of being I could be the grand stream and every bright nutrient would bloat my cells. So when people drank, they too would grow golden. I'd be sure to flow at just the right speed. So when visitors came to rest along my shore, they'd be reminded gently of keeping a steady pace. More than likely it would be one of those subtle but ultimately significant changes the way a river rock rearranged forms new braids of water, and this discourse affects the flow of the communal body. Truth is, I hate the way my name looks on the page without the E. Like part of me is missing, masculine, so far from water. Outside, eerie exhales large, frothed breaths to the, to the shore as the sky goes mauve to purple to black. God is God is God. I call it storm cloud, unforeseeable potential to come down or not, to wet us until we seek cover, silken or go on walking. Okay, um, so I will, I'm, I, I turned on a timer, but you can let me know too. Um, I'm going to read from In This Distance. So
So like I said, I'm hoping this book is coming out next year. Uh, I wrote this maybe three years ago, so it already feels a little bit old, but um, new in comparison. So I'm excited to read from it. So this book, um, there are some crossover with this project and before I had the word, but um, this book is really interested in the relationship between the erotic and the ecstatic. There are three speakers or figures in this book. Um, one is Esther Perel, who is a contemporary relationship therapist. If you're not familiar, she has tons of stuff online, um, TED Talks and all kinds of information about her work. Uh, and Audre Lorde. Um, so Esther Perel and Audre Lorde, although they're from different, um, I mean, they're both contemporary, but they both talk about the erotic as something that's sort of separate from the sexual, but it's a kind of creative life force. Um, and Esther Perel talks about like desire in romantic relationships and how we need like distance uh, a lot of the time to maintain desire. So these were some of the ideas that were sort of binding this project together. So there's, um, I'm sorry, so there's Esther Perel, Audre Lorde, and there's the biblical figure of Eve, and they're all sort of, and the speaker as well, and they're all sort of operating under these themes of um, the erotic and the ecstatic and the kind of relationship between those two things. So I'm going to start with a poem that's called, and this comes in the beginning of this book, um, when Audre Lorde says erotic, I hear ecstatic. When Audre Lorde says erotic, I hear ecstatic. Because when she says the erotic is knowledge deeply born, there is something so lovely in that phrasing, I feel a moment of transcendence. Because I'm called back to Sharon Olds after making love in winter, where the body after sex is blessed, holy, rendered godly, full of light and even rebirth. So in this way, Lord is right. The erotic is the opposite of pornography. Because the ecstatic is overwhelming happiness and involves a mystic self-transcendence. Therefore, so much joy exists within just one small word. I agree with Lord when she says we should not separate the spiritual and the erotic. Because just the other day, I read about a father who pulled glass out of his little girl's foot, not with his hands, but with his mouth. What about that sacred tenderness? And speaking of the mouth, what about what the mouth does in order to get an olive down to its pit? What about the olive and its salty flesh? Because I can perfectly recall the cadence of my grandfather's voice when calling my grandmother honey. Lord, if the erotic is the personification of love, how could it not be full of the ecstatic? No, we don't have to use God, nor man, nor afterlife. I think you said it best when you said it's when your body stretches to music, when you're dancing, writing a poem, making love, examining an idea. Yes, I say ecstatic. I might say holy. I might word it God, then cross it out and say me and you because we are enough. Yes, I believe the erotic is the ecstatic's twin. They are girls, of course. Girls like the lilies on the counter with full bodies of their own and mouths open to receive the sun. Their scent almost as delicious and well-traveled as lust because even this is not enough. I rise to touch them. Okay. Um, I don't like reading too long, but I'll keep going. I think I'm at like 15 or 16 minutes. Um, okay, so uh, there's a, as I mentioned, there's a series of Eve poems in this book and they're dispersed throughout the book, but they follow a trajectory. 
Um, and they're prose poems, so they're written in a paragraph. This is called, I Like to Imagine, and it has a quote uh, by, from Esther Perel. I like to imagine, and this is the quote, it is our imagination that is responsible for love. I like to imagine Eve, naked, of course, falling in love with Adam, not because he made her feel safe or comfortable, but because he made her feel ravenous. I like to imagine Eve imagining Adam who had dissed her in the morning and gotten moody. Adam who said, I'll be back soon and wasn't. Now it's the golden hour and, Le and Eve leaning against the tree imagines a more prosperous tree and Adam with a woman with bigger tits, fuller lips, the two diving into each other's mouths. No one will ever kiss Eve the way he does. And Eve, feeling both desire and jealousy, the close cousins of want, gets wet. The more she imagines, the wetter she gets. Adam finding beauty without her. Adam at a distance, eating thinly sliced figs from the navel of another. Adam so capable of forgetting her for an afternoon. And so Eve had never wanted him more. And because she aches, she reaches. The fruit is sweet. On her second bite, he sneaks up behind her, grabbing her at the ribs. I missed you, he says. So she tosses the fruit into the brush and takes his hand in to feel her. So a little sexual. Um, okay. Um, the next poem is called Adam. And I don't, I didn't like this poem, but people have been telling me they like it. So I've never read it out loud to anybody. Um, okay, Adam. Because he's a Scorpio, he's brought with him some strange, alluring gift. A bone, a feather, something slight and ephemeral. A gentle reminder that he could be gone too. If Adam were a Scorpio, then maybe he would have been born in late October my favorite season, the dark season, fall. At night with Eve, he would have talked abstractly about the world because back then everything was magic. The lack of language, luminous. Lack of science to name even the sunset or the smell of fruit ripening on the tree. I like to imagine how beautiful it all would have been and terrifying, like the Scorpio, all night and darkness, mystery and abandon, unabashed about nakedness, first kiss without a word for swoon, all feeling and flesh. Back when everything was so close without having the word perigee, and the moon was so close, Eve sticking out her tongue could almost taste it, and Adam knew she was beautiful. He felt more beautiful in her presence, and he forgot about God, though God was so close, and believed he had created the world. He whispered to Eve in perfect explanations. This is how, and this is why. Um, I'm actually going to skip a few, I think. So this poem is switching out of the Eve poems and is um, more in the voice of the speaker themselves. Perigee. In the beginning, I was so full on you, I could hardly eat. New lovers, you fed me each piece of your novelty. Arms, breath, skin, words. In bed together for days, we barely moved. Yes, there was sun to feed us. Now I'm thinking it's absence that we need in order to know we're full. In the beginning, I could watch you across a room and delight in what existed in between our distance. Because I didn't know you, I believed again we were creating something new. 
Everything was novel and nothing was full, so we were filled. My beloved, I love you, but you are so close now. Just for a moment, I'd like to touch you in the dark and not mistake you as mine. Okay, I think I'll just read two more. Um, <clears throat> So I'll switch back to an Eve poem. So Eve, in in conjunction with the speaker, they both like they move away from their home. So the speaker is moving away from a particular landscape, and Eve is also moving away from um, from Eden. Okay, um, Eve leaves Eden because she hasn't been alone since she was born, because the romance has worn off because she has been here for eternity and yes things can be too perfect here it is always summer and the fruit trees are always in bloom adam has shown a new devotion to her which makes her want him less the serpent has started to tell her stories of places with hardened edges buildings and balconies and people with tormented expressions he tells her tales and whispers over firelight while Adam is cooking dinner. There are places with traffic and men with lean and muscular bodies. In her imagination, Eve begins walking, and as she walks, she comes into herself. There is a man in the city who is waiting for her, his body adorned in tattoos with a tender voice and hands that pin her down to a soft bed. There are women too, the serpent says. Their cheeks shine red and they'll tease you too. In the city, there are fruit markets, but more grease. So many things to make a body feel good in the moment. You might, the snake warns, feel really bad later. But Eve holding on to the snake's every word wants to feel some anguish while being pinned down to a bed by a man with strong hands. She begins her voyage away from her home, and it is the last thing the snake said that pulls her forward. In this new world, there are people who call out to God, not because they believe, but simply because they feel good. They sing, oh God, oh, oh. Okay, I'm gonna read one more poem um, and that's it. Uh, so this is in the new manuscript, but it definitely calls back to some of the missing O oh, stuff in the word God from um, before I had the word. So this poem is called A Case Against Omitting the O oh in God. I'll admit it, sometimes I do like it without the O. Oh. Not out of respect, the reason some of my Jewish kin write it. God, G dash D, but because I like the way it looks, God, G dash D, so wholly unfinished, incomplete, like the term itself, so opposite of ardent, fever, or cock, ache, honeysuckle, or even moon or bloom with their double O's, so much like breasts, God so incapable of getting at what's most holy and reverent. It doesn't even sound nice, like horoscope, willow, bewitch, catacomb, or languid. But really, I love the O, the letter, the sound, the shape, how it makes me think of fullness, the body's ecstasy cresting at the mouth in the shape of an O, open, ode, orgasm, you. Because if we are going to assign a word to all of the multiplicities, it should at least have its center. Circular like the sun and moon and the earth, circular and never ending. So when people see it on the page, they might be reminded of life. And there is so much life. Remember how good it felt to sup on the beloved? or to sit alone, needing no one, and autumn, when autumn was bursting all around you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. 
Thank you, Brooke. And we're just going to move right along. And there will be some time afterwards for um, a few questions to both of the presenters tonight. But now, David Wilk. David Wilk is both a producer of literature and a servant of literature. He has served through work with editing, publishing, Truck, and City Point Press, and The Weird Times, among other endeavors, and stints with distribution companies he has founded and with the National Endowment for the Arts as director of its literature program at a time that the endowment gave instrumental help to what may have been seen as the fringes or beginnings of an alternative literature of innovation, experimentation, and engagement, including to one press whose work I know intimately, Black Mesa, which morphed into Chax Press several decades ago. His publishing work includes a groundbreaking early truck magazine issue devoted to the poet Laureen Niedeker, now recognized as one of the key American poets of 20th mid-century, but then hardly known at all outside an extremely small group of colleagues. In writing about that issue, Wilk names his own literary ancestors and peer compadres as William Carlos Williams, Robert Creeley, Allen Ginsberg, Charles Olson, Susan Howe, Maureen Owen, Jerry Rothenberg, Nate Mackey, Lynn Hegenian, and C.D. Wright, followed by an ellipsis that I think includes others in the company, as Creeley might have put it. Some know Wilk more for this service to the art in these various roles than know his literary art. This should change over time, judging by the unearthing work in his most recent chapbook, The Archaeology of Light, where he declares of wounded sister that eventually she will escape and only know the hallowed rooms within her own mind. A point of view that directs us unerringly to the spaces in which poetry finds its incipients. We will find Wilkes poetry, I think, and to quote him, black and white images transmitted into space. We are here. We are waiting for you to find us. Please welcome David Wilk. Thank you, Charles. You were really good at introductions, <laughs> I have to say. Um, so I'm standing up. I can't sit down and do this. I'm sort of reminded of poetry readings that I've done in the past, always standing, not sitting. So. Um, hopefully this works. I'm in front of standing up in front of the Zoom. Um, I, I had written out a whole bunch of stuff, and as usual, I think hearing Brooke and everyone else uh, has caused me to change my approach a little bit. But I just want to give everyone greetings. I consider this Pog's Zoom land, um, and I guess I should say for anybody who hasn't figured it out yet, I am not Jerry Rothenberg. Um, I'm taller than he is. Um, I'm not as old as he is, but he speaks much better Yiddish than I do. Um, and so tonight, you know, I feel sort of a little bit like that, you know, either I'm like the relief pitcher or the, uh, you know, the, the comedian coming out from the, like you're, you, you know, the backstage comedian who's been hauled out on stage because the, uh, you know, the star couldn't make it. And you look around and say, what am I doing here? But anyway, I'm going to do my best. I'm not going to be Jerry, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about his work before I start doing something of my own, uh, because he actually has meant a lot to me. Um, I first learned, and I, I wrote this down, I'm sorry, it's not extemporaneous, but I first learned about Jerry's work uncovering, collecting, and presenting writing, music, dance, and other creations made by Native and Indigenous people while I was in college. I was studying anthropology and linguistics, and my main area of interest then, and still, was studying and understanding all kinds of creation myths. I was deeply interested in the ways that myth and language interact to determine cultural and spiritual meaning, to place cultures in constant relation with their surroundings, the natural world, their language expressing meaning and mystery, their history, their gods, goddesses, medicine, spirit animals, their imagined selves, their actual flesh, 
all defined, brought to life and carried forward in time through storytelling and performance. Jerry, along with collaborators like Dennis Tedlock and Pierre Juris and others, brought many of us into contact with an incredible range of work that otherwise might not have been available uh, to anyone. I was reading, you know, at that time, the Bureau of American Ethnology reports, he was going even further and finding stuff that no one had ever um, recognized as being as important as the Western canon. And I think that he really, really broke ground there. Uh, in his own exploratory writing with ongoing energy, devotion, and intelligence, he's created and traveled paths toward meaning and cross-cultural understanding for more than seven decades. So these are two poems of Jerry's that I think at least are representative, um, and I hope I can give them proper uh, good service, you know, honor them as they are written. This one, the first one is called Urgilgul, the, the Possessed. And this is a really dark poem, and I'm really sorry, but it is just extraordinary and powerful and really important and resonates right now. One, he picks a coin up from the ground. It burns his hand like ashes. It is red and marks him as it marks the others, hidden. He is hidden in the forest in a world of nails. His dibic fills him, too. Each night, another one would hang himself. Airless boxcars, Kaddish. What will they do with us? The brown and black spots on their bellies, so many clothes. The field was littered. 10,000 corpses in one place, arranged in layers. I am moving down the field from right to left, reversing myself at every step. The ground approaches, money. And still, his greatest fear was that he would lose his shoes. Three, earth, growing fat with the slime of corpses, green and pink, that ooze like treacle, turn into a kind of tallow, that are black at evening, that absorb all light in this one. Ugh. Okay, A Paradise of Poets, one. He takes a book down from his shelf and scribbles across a page of text. I am the final one. This means the world will end when he does. Two, in the inferno, Dante conceives a paradise of poets and calls it limbo. Foolishly, he thinks his place is elsewhere. Three, now the time has come to write a poem about a paradise of poets. I love that poem. It's important for me to tell you that I am truly honored to be here this evening, and I want to thank Charles Alexander and Pog, Steve, and everyone else for inviting me to read. On the other hand, those of you who are expecting to hear Jerry Rea's work, I'm sorry if you're disappointed by me being his replacement. Anyway, I'm going to start with a longish, well, I was going to start with a long poem of mine, but I realized it's it's just, it's too long. So I, I quickly um, made a substitution. But I want to say, um, somehow I ended up thinking a lot about process um, about what is writing. And so some of what this reading is about is about the process of writing. Um, I think about Jack Spicer a lot. Um, and most of the poems that I've written that have any value whatsoever, uh, are they come from a dream state. They come from a place that is unidentifiable. It's not what I am writing. It's what I'm allowing to be written through me. Uh, and I've, so I've sort of, I've been trying to explore how to do that. Um, I think most of the time it's best just to try to get out of the way and allow the poem to come through, which is really hard to do. The imagist and objectivist poets had a part of it really right. Removing ego, becoming as selfless as possible would allow the work to emerge. And I've wondered if most writing should best be considered simply practice, writing to tune the instrument and allow the spirits to become present. Then maybe you get lucky, almost, truly, like playing the lottery. Uh, and I hear this from songwriters who say that, you know, all those hours of practice and then the song comes as if it was magic. And I really believe it is magic. So that's one way to find poems, a bit like the automatic writing Burroughs did, but without the heroine and not in a seance or in a trance, but just to be present, attentive, aware. 
So the next piece is one, I just wrote this last week here at the Tucson Book Festival, listening to the wonderful Simon Ortiz and Ophelia Zepeda talking in conversation, talking about uh, Simon's latest book, Light is Light, and about his life as an Acoma speaking bilingual poet. So it was, it's kind of like when artists go out and they sketch really fast just to see if you can capture it. And that's what I was trying to do here. So most of these are, these are his words. They're just the words that I felt resonated. And I wrote them down in a, you know, just while listening to him speak. Um, and so I guess it's a poem. Simon Ortiz, Tucson, 310-24. Machina, the word. Cultural attention. Acoma language world, grandma spider, yellow girl. We speak upon a certain matter, the correct way of living one's life. The future will be lived with care and love. Names are important, the poet, the storyteller, a comment made several times now, red boy, red petal girl, the purpose of a story, the names, enticement, Something going on may or may not be wrong, a way of behavior, exploration. More than is possible in years past, in those times, resistance, resistance, struggle for light, state of being, into the future, we will be our own people. So speaking, we're, you know, we're talking, I think, partially thinking about uh, Lynn Higinian and Earlier today, I was talking with Charles about Anselm Hollow, uh, who was someone we both knew and who passed not recently, but a few years ago. Um, and, and I started, and I wish I could, I can't remember the name of the book of his that I was reading and I'm away from home, so I can't look at it. But I started reading this one of Anselm's last books and it might be his last. And I decided I would write a poem every day um, after reading a poem of his trying not to get in the way of the response, but just see how his poem led to another poem um, and help me understand his poem for myself. So this one's called Zoom Cognition. A riff on Tuesday or any day, one day you ran off, sorry, one day you ran off the road in the snow coming home from a bar. That was surely Zoom Cognition. Two, bark falls. A trunk full of toys, a barking dog, a toy story when your elephant had left the room, speaking French and bad Latin all the way home. Bark falls from the trunk. You say bye and get home. Three, charm circle. Pretend you're not here, but when I hear you singing the blues, I know you deep-throated, in constant motion, every minute a story, a song, a breath, so deeply felt, the moon appears above your head. Four, the loving somnambulist. I'm proud of myself that I could say that word. Your tall tale telling strike, sorry, your tall tale telling strikes again as a dangling part of something simpler. The she in this story is a dancer, she tells you exactly what to say and do if you wish to love her madly. Her good graces, after all, drive you to drink, but never sorrowfully. It's that other thing about her that sometimes makes you wonder, where did she come from? And is this all just a story from a dream or formed of memory and shadowed heartbeats tapping out messages of perfect sonnets fixed in space? As we are in love, asleep, awake, always dreaming, true love calls. Number five, history tells us something. History tells us something, or otherwise, while not looking, you call them nooks or crannies, hiding places for the detritus of past misdeeds, as capitalism has its way with us, ever searching for the handles of our dreams, ensuring we are under control and can't find a way out. Once inside and the music still playing provides a sort of illusory joy, all our senses fully engaged, running amok, sometimes sideways, but mostly in circles pretending to be getting somewhere. 
So this is how the story goes. The ancients predicted all of it. The rhymes and fake mythologies. There are beasts at every turn. No way out. So make the best of it. Have a drink. Get some rest and go on dreaming. Six, while you're not looking. Someone took your place in line. You rambled and lost track of time. Inevitably, you felt betrayed and the magic tales you told seem lost without you. In the garden, someone else tends your plants and pretends not to miss you. Your hands, your untethered sense of humor, your glancing at the sun when you thought no one could see. So now where are you? How are you feeling? Let's dance while the moon still allows us one more brief fandango. The stars are watching, but we don't care. I'm standing still and waiting for another song to sing. Catch me before I fall. And this one is seven, there's only eight. You rode in on a feather. Drunk or sleeping, you dreamed a wall of snow, an inevitable distance between the here and there where you still were standing, talking about the finish line. And before the gun went off, you jumped. A stampede of drivers followed you off the next cliff and into the ditch where you found yourself cold and wondering how to get home. And eight, this is the last one, but we digress. Mobile cinematic action, take your, take your places. All around us, the elements of digression and indirection causing disconnection. It's no surprise the 21st century pandemic breeds contempt and inability to see straight. So say the demons on our shoulders. They have it right. There's no blessing for the noblest who are no more immune than the rest of us, churning to become safe. Or was it just another distraction from the practice of Zazen we have no control and that's a good thing. So rise up while you can, take your places while all around us, the singers lose their songs. There's a path outside this window. So follow it and don't look back. Um, okay, so I've got another poem here that I wrote more or less as automatically as possible. It's from a long drive across one of the great expanses of place and space in America. It's definitely not inspired by Charles Olson, but you may hear the voice of Ed Dorn kind of sitting on my shoulder as I do every time I visit that place. It's called West Texas. Um, not that far from here and it's really worth going to. I know Charles has been there. Um, anyway, drive, to Austin, drive from here to Austin and you'll see all of this. We watch the few cars go by on a highway just beyond the horizon. Feather-like light, seeming to breathe the width and time of noise, spent life on Mars. Incredible voyage, oh, voyager. She was a delightful voyeur, then lost in space, brave and heartless as the moon, any moon. She sang for us. We drove on into the endless night. I went across a sea. It was a sea of dunes and hills called mesas in the vernacular of that place. How could our landscape be so foreign and the words so sullen? But now I am cloaked in sunshine. We're in a breathless race to discover the location of oceans on another planet. We may never arrive. So what are we waiting for, she said. Get out of the car and do something. But I am not seeing what lands in front of me and have created traffic jams beyond the present time where everything moves like fire in the deepest wilderness, my ever-present heart beating up a storm. Yes, I said, that was my music, and it is my guitar, and I won't return it. Mars may never care, or any planet. It's free will, not astrology. More cars on the highway ahead, a lethal moment. The effervescent sky means nothing to me now. Before we go any further, I have imagined space as pure light, but the sky above has not disappeared. Across the road, a sign emerges. Delight depends on nothing. You've been driving forever. You look so tired, someone said out of the dark sky. Maybe then we could not see where we were going, but went ahead anyway. Dizzy as the road rises ahead, the radio is off, but we hear voices anyway. Don't mescalero with Mr. Bill. His dollar is as good as yours. 
If you're looking for answers in these hills and valleys, you might be lost forever. There are none here and they tend to slink away in the middle of the night anyway. There is no life on Mars, regardless of the differences between us. That is the reason I never really sleep. Is this a movie or something more substantial? Music, music, music. The soft sounds repatriate the night. Some guitar-shaped moon is in the sky. Now that is an elevation. And so we elevate. And then we finally see our destination. All right, just a couple more. Um, this one is also really of that kind, at least I tried for, um, and I, you know, I just, you never know, I don't know. Our social experiment. Imagine this face is a person, not a collection of facts and histories, just tired old news. A woman wakes up to find herself a man. More collections, stories, ransacked rooms, children awake. Do you believe in the industriousness of the intelligentsia? Are they coddled? Do they deserve everything they think they have? The ever vigilant observers question everything except the marketplace of ideas. The selves long sought in available containers, the shelves carefully filled with cryogenic experiments, Imagine this person inside a room, inside a factory, making music with talented romantic fingers wrapped around the stanchions, abruptly fallen. In going through the closets after she died, we found no memories, but salt, feathers, particularities of desire that survived her convictions. Once these places had meaning, history has overturned everything. During the Red Scare, some of us were afraid to talk out loud. Our basic sense of privacy has been occluded by invasions of our own meaningless selves. The true masters of sex are evaporated into carbon dioxide, floating in spaces impossible to explore. The moon landing defines us. Believe it or not, we are restless as children, trying on new clothes, pinned to the wall, gathering moss behind the school. Those shadows we see are mistaken. If you close your eyes, you can see Wisconsin shimmering in the heat. My history lives inside your words. It is absolute, maybe even psychotic. I breathe in the magical dust of mushrooms, sequencing your DNA in my lungs and heart. The gathering storm is irrelevant. Factions of former witnesses are still trying to climb the walls. The charm school lies in wait, murdering the one exotic dancer still hard at work. A perfect measure, a helicopter's rushing wings, a single bird building a broken nest. Um, this one is not a poem. This is really like a, a note to myself, a sort of weird poetics, you know, and um, I think of it when I think about Lynn Hegini and I think about all those people working on poetic, I never had the understanding of poetics that they did. So um, it comes out in different ways, but this is my, my shot or my approach to poetics, the archeology span of memory. Memory at specific moments is overwhelming, a sagging beast of burden under the weight of mystery. Glimpses of song lyrics and shards of songs trigger place memories. And as I am doing now, digging through boxes of old papers becomes an archeological expedition, returning previous self to current self. As it is when talking about past experiences and events with family or old friends restores long forgotten emotional bridges to buried selves. Who then is the person surfing through time? Where does I stand in all this detritus of being and memories memorializing what and who I or it was and now am, so often forgetting the constant crucible of self-shaping? How does the universe contain all this stuff anyway? Are the cells of space and time like any human brain, always processing, replacing, and burning away the past? Just now I'm reading Nate Mackey saying poetry processes poisons, referring to Robert Duncan's view of poetry as a Gnostic practice. I believe this is true of all life. There is no such thing as cell extinction. 
poetry, the antenna practice, is vibrating with truths and understandings only art or deep medication, meditation can connect to and with. Poets and artists are constantly recording the flora and fauna of memory and the space-time continuum so other travelers can experience the signals, not the noise. And that means, so that means dig deeper in the dirt. All right, a couple more and then I will end this. Um, so this goes back to Jack Spicer and his um, belief that Martians were presenting him with poems. How to use the Jack Spicer poetry machine. Turn off noise, enter wait state, still mind, Zazen style, wait. Connect mind to writing device through neural pathways to hand and finger, wait. Visualize tool of mind to hand, wait. Remember koan, never mind, no matter. Wait, if words appear, Right. Uh, this one is for Jerry, uh, called Creation Story. Because for each of us, there is a hole in the sky, because there is no beginning aside from birth, because there is a moment when we see clearly, because all is never lost, because here your heart is mine and mine is yours, because no other world exists beyond our own beyond our own because there are only other worlds and universes where the smallest of us is the greatest and the land stretches out beyond because there is here and now and there and every place in between. Okay, and this is the last one I'm gonna re read. I'm thinking about lost friends. I'm gonna dedicate this to Lynn Hijinian and all friends recently departed at least at once at ease. If it is possible to remember as an act of love, summoning the spirit of old friends, poets, mystics, lost souls, with charms, crystals, a feather, fire cupped in the palms, a nod to history, a suggestion of memory. If it is possible for us to see past the veiled darkness into other dimensions with dreams, acrobatics, chanting, drumming, singing dream songs, and prayers to sun and moon and all the directions, and burning tobacco. It is, if it is possible, the moon will answer. Our dearest friends will call out from their own distant memories, their names for, forgotten, their tongues dry, faces, hands immobile. What is possible then, and what is lost? I will summon you. I will call your name. I will pray. I will dance. You are not forgotten or lost, but in a dream that will always be a dream. If it is possible, it will always be possible. Fire, feather, stone, memory, song, words, the spaces between spaces and words between words folded upon themselves, forming mountains and rivers and hills and valleys. It is possible to imagine all of you everywhere still and all in dreams, with love, and everywhere, all in all, everything we imagine lost, but never gone. Thank you. <laughs> Charles, you're muted. I think people can unmute themselves now. Uh, please tell me if you, if you could. Yeah, I see it happening, and it would be great to take a few questions. Um, and uh, I know there's people here who are good at asking questions. So, so uh, please just hold up your hand, and or if nobody's talking, go ahead and say something. Thank, thank you both. It was wonderful. Both of you. Yeah, great readings. Yeah. I like the I, I liked um both the readings very much. I, in Brooks, I, I I like how you've um focused on missing letters and that and how that can change or mean 
kind of esoteric meanings in that. That was very interesting. Like that. And David, I love that last poem. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Well, I, I think actually, I know this was put together in, you know, maybe at the last minute, but the, uh, what happens a lot in Pog is that there's a really unexpected and strange and marvelous synergy between two readers who just come together. And, and, and I don't think that we could have, if we tried to do this deliberately, we could not have had, had a better uh, yeah. symmetry. So I, I think what you, know, what, what you said, Maureen, about Brooke here playing with absence and with mm -hmm. but I think in the, in, the, in the titles of your books too, right? If I only had this word that I can never find and now this mm -hmm. sense of distance and the missing letter and David, you also, you know, this, this sense of dispossession, use that word and the spaces between the spaces. And uh, what do you, what do we do to fill that if possible? And maybe it's always something which is deferred and meaning which is always, you know, in process of being found. Distance is its own meaning, right? But I think that's just, you know, that's a poetic for our times. And I think that's marvelous. I'm so, I, I, I didn't know either of your work nearly as well as I'd like to. And now I feel like there's definitely an affinity. So come back every week. I mean, this is really. <laughs> Brooke, I, I felt like your poem, Adam, um, actually is, you should listen to your friends. That is really a good poem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It was a pleasure hearing. Brooke, you were speaking about the use of the dash in God's name, because now we use the dash for people whose names we don't want to utter, like <laughs> putting three dashes in the middle of our the former president's <laughs> surname. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought about that too a little bit. The way that's yeah that's used and I always found it yeah just a ridiculous thing um, especially since it's like on one hand religious texts elevate language and language is so important and then it's like we take out this <laughs> this letter as respect even though I don't know. Yeah, but you're right too that we use sometimes just mm -hmm. you could think of names the the, You could think of it as the replacement of the infinite circle with the infinite line, you know. So maybe and it's not really, you know, it's not really a replacement, but there's a different geometry. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking that the elimination of the infinite circle. It's a very strange thing to take out of that equation, you know, of, of what is going on. I was kind of interested, David, you know, you invoke um, your forerunners uh, from Ed Dorn to Anselm Hollow to Jack Spicer to Jerry Rothenberg, the ones I mentioned. Uh, Brooke, I imagine yours, you know, I, I, I imagine maybe connections to Sappho, to Rumi, in, in my mind, a wonderful um, Canadian poet, Phyllis Webb, and then maybe in a totally perverse way to Kathy Acker's work. Um, yeah. Could you say something about what writers are, you know, models or influential on you? Uh, particularly yeah. in terms of what you're doing with um, that connection of the erotic to the ecstatic. Yeah, I am embarrassingly ignorant of older poetry. I read mainly contemporary poets. Um, I like the Kathy Acker. I like just got into, I mean, I don't even, I wouldn't even say I got into Kathy Acker, but I just familiarized myself with her work. Um, for poetry, I really like Leela Chati. Um, she writes a lot of, a lot of her poetry examines her to religious backgrounds and in relationship to the body. I like her a lot. 
I read a lot of fiction. I also write fiction, short stories, and I'm, ugh, my spring break, I've been revising a novel and it's been killing me. Um, I really like Lauren Groff. I don't know if that reference actually speaks to my poetry, but to, I mean, to me it does, especially Lauren Groff's new-ish novel, Matrix, is, is a huge, work for me um inspirational work matrix i also liked her new novel the vaster wilds but um i don't know i mean when i was an undergrad i thought i would never have to read poetry as a creative writing major <laughs> i thought i was just going to go for fiction and then <laughs> i was quickly <laughs> schooled like oh you you have to read poetry and i knew nothing i i mean i had only read Robert Frost when I was, you know, like 10. Um, and my teacher just showed us contemporary writers. I got into, I mean, how I think a lot of people do, like I read a lot of Sharon Olds and Tony Hoagland. I'm trying to remember the last part of your question, uh, Charles. Um, oh, just in terms of your the, the exploring that relation of the erotic and the ecstatic, what writers oh, yeah. may have inspired that. Yeah, this was, I mean, this, that just happened over one summer. It was the summer of 2020. I'm usually not a date person, but I remember because it was COVID and I was in Prescott. I hadn't moved back yet and I was staying at my mom's and it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, I was just sitting outside a lot and I just started getting really into Esther Perel and I was listening to Audre Lorde on YouTube, um, recordings of her read and and that's how I mean of course it can change right like I the way that I become inspired can change but for me like that's what it's been taking is like these just I hear something or I read something and I see a connection between a few things and then it just um, kind of it came out of that. So I was just reading Esther Perel, listening to Esther Perel, getting into some of Audre Lorde's stuff. And also I had been thinking about all of those things prior to that. So it just felt really miraculous that I had stumbled upon those works. And I, um, I just start, I make really messy brain maps where I just start making like a web of connected ideas and that all happened in the summer of 2020 listening to their stuff and I don't usually listen to things I mean I'm very much like I like to have a physical copy so it was interesting too because I was doing a lot of just listening of recordings and I was just, and I mean, like Audre Lorde and Esther Perel are not the only people to talk about the erotic this way. I mean, I think like Freud talks about it too, as this, this kind of like creative life force. Um, and then I brought, yeah, I started thinking about Eve and like, I don't know, it all just sort of came together in a messy brain map. And then I started writing poems. Thank you. So David, um, I'm glad you got a chance to hear Simon Ortiz. Um, he read at the um, special collections at the U of A a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I had the opportunity then. Um, did he read his Blues in Beijing poem when you no, at this at this event, it was just a conversation. Oh, a conversation. Um, yes, I mean it was a really good conversation, but he did not, not read anything. Uh -huh. And all, they did talk. Look, only the one book, Light Is Light, um, right, and, and nothing else. Uh, but he didn't, to my at least while I was there, there was no reading of any poetry. This was just uh -huh. talking about process and history and language and. I see. Simon's um, work more in yeah. general. Um, well, it seemed like he had some similar influences as you did from 
from that poem anyway. And uh, yeah, I, when I heard him, he was in a conversation after the reading with um, Ophelia also. So, um, well, that's great. I'm glad you got to hear him speak anyway. Yeah, she is awesome. He's wonderful also. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I somehow managed to see her three or four times in the last year just through different venues and it's been great. I think I saw her on a, there was a Zoom of a, an event at U of A that, that I saw last year that um, she was extraordinary. Yeah, she did something at Agua Caliente Park recently. And um, she talked a lot about her childhood that I hadn't heard her talk about before. And it was very interesting. Nice. David, you... Uh... You have the work uh, Archaeology of Light, and then you read from Archaeology of Memory. And I think of, you know, Charles Olson calling himself an archaeologist of mourning, uh, which seems to be a methodology of working, which I which I think of as very different from Jack Spicer's. I don't even know if Jack would have called his a methodology, <laughs> you know, a methodology of reception, maybe a reception of whatever's coming in from wherever it comes. Um, do you see those things as related or maybe as different poles of working? Well, you know, it's interesting you you ask that because you know the where I see the archaeology is in relation to exploring self, and that you're kind of, you know, you're digging into yourself where and you're still uncovering things that um, appear to you that that are yourself that you didn't know um, or your history or your memory. Um, I don't, I see that as not different in a sense. Uh, it's just on a different direction, you know, that Spicer or anytime you're like Orpheus, you know, you're receiving from, this other place, but I, I think I always thought of Orpheus, and I think of Spicer too, and I think Duncan would say the same thing that there, um, the the plane of existence might as well be inside you, but it isn't, um, or not recognizably, um, but we're all in the same place, exploring these other uh, dimensions, the dimensional dimensionality, whether it's inside or outside, is kind of a construct that we apply to it. So in, in the sense that the words give us that, you know, I look at direction as the archaeological dig, but the astronomy work is looking up in the sky. <laughs> so, you know, you can be an astronomer and an archaeologist at this, you're just at different times of day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's sort of how I think of it. Any other questions? Or shall we say good night to all and hope to see you again? <laughs> I just want to say thank you, David, because I've never heard you read. And uh, I really, really enjoyed hearing what you had to say. And and Brooke, too, thank you. Thank you. That, was a, that was a treat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and sometime in the next